if you can make season eight of Game of Thrones an enjoyable experience, like that's what Buddha figured out. That's what enlightenment is. Is living your life and being able to enjoy season eight of Game of Thrones. That's enlightenment. Modern day definition of enlightenment. Okay, let's do let's do this question about suicide. Uh, my question: I don't have thoughts of suicide, but my desire to live life to live is really low. I don't want to die, and my morals and ethics are really against suicide. But how does how do one distinguish between thoughts of not wanting to live and wanting to die? Don't worry, I'm not in danger of doing anything. I just don't want my perspective. I just don't want my perspective to change over time. Ah, I'm assuming that by your perspective to change over time, you mean you want to not start thinking about suicide as opposed to not wanting to live. Um, I hope your perspective changes over time, but I hope what changes is your desire to live gets higher. So let me read this again. I don't have thoughts of suicide, but my desire to live is really low. I don't want to die, and my morals and ethics are really against suicide. But how does one distinguish between thoughts of not wanting to live and wanting to die? Fantastic question. Um, so I think it's important to okay so let's just talk about <clears throat> this is a great question I love it so I'm a psychiatrist I treat depression right so depression is like when people feel like their mood is really low and they feel unhappy and sometimes they can be suicidal. They don't feel like doing anything. They feel amotivated. And sometimes when I'm treating someone with depression, there comes a day where they come into my office and then I kind of assess them for depression. So I use some kinds of tools. Like I'll use like something called the Beck Depression Inventory or the Hamilton Depression Scale. Um, and I'll have a conversation with them, which is a very strange conversation. They say, I'm unhappy. And like, I feel like the depression hasn't gone away. And based on the scales, and I'll ask them, like, are you able to get out of bed every day? They say, yes. Can you go to work every day? They say, yes. Do you have difficulty concentrating? No. So why do you feel like you're depressed? And they say like, well, I just don't, I don't feel like doing anything. I feel like my life like doesn't have any meaning. And then I say, okay, so this is as far as your depression. Uh, this is as far as treatment for depression can take you. There's a difference between depression and unhappiness. We've treated your depression. The problem now is that you're unhappy. And these are two different things. And one of the biggest mistakes that's been made in like modern mental health thinking is that we've started conflating unhappiness with depression. People who are unhappy say that they are depressed. And that sort of makes sense because like that word works. But there's a difference between a clinical depression and being unhappy. Right? There's a difference between being ill and like having a life that has no meaning. Those are two entirely different things. And so I think that the issue with lupus is, is, is so the, and the way I'd put it is, there's a, there's a huge difference. There's a cavernous difference between not wanting to live or not caring to live and wanting to die. And no, 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 no. So you guys are, this is completely wrong. Depression equals over a longer time? No, what I'm saying is that the color and flavor, these are two entirely different things. It's like one is something you see and one is something you hear. Completely different spectrums. Not related at all. But unhappiness le leads to depression, also untrue. Also untrue. So I'm defining things in a particular way. Oftentimes people who are depressed are also happy, unhappy. But sometimes people who are depressed are content. So you guys have to understand that the axis of your mind is different from, like, the axis of your Atman or your true self. That there's a difference between pain and suffering. Does that make sense? Like, suffering and pain are two different things. And so I think what lupus is dealing with is that they don't have a good reason to live. Because their life probably lacks meaning which is absolutely a problem, but the solution to that problem is different from treating depression. Now, in this case, I would recommend that someone gets an evaluation um, for depression, right? Because, like, you should just get checked out for depression. 
But like, so now the question becomes, so a lot of people are thinking a little bit about, you know, what's the difference between these two? Can't they relate to each other? Sure, they can relate because we everything can relate. We're a human being and the different parts of ourselves interact. But I'll give you guys an example. So this is the example that I always use when I talk about pain and suffering. So the first question is, what's the difference between pain and suffering? So, like, when I get a massage, sometimes technically I'm in pain, but it feels really good. I'm not suffering at all. It just feels really good. When I'm on call, like, that's painful. Like, it's painful to not sleep for 24 hours. But I feel fulfilled. Like, I feel like I'm doing good work and I don't suffer. Right? Even if we think about, like, physical pain, like, I got a flu shot the other day. Like, that was painful, but it didn't cause me suffering. So, Sanskrit is the best word to understand, uh, best language to understand this. Buddha talked about something called duk. Duk means suffering. And what he said is that duk is outside of the, the mind, actually. That within the mind, we experience emotions, right? Like sadness. And then duk is suffering. So, I'll give you guys another example from my life. So, my dad passed away several years ago. And I was sad and I was grieved, but like I was kind of also. You know, like I thought it was his time and I understood that he had lived a full life. And am I am I still sad that he's not alive today? Yeah, but I'm not like I don't suffer because of it. Right. It would be different if I lost my wife or lost my kids like then my suffering would be intense. Like there's a difference between sadness and suffering. Like there's there's a certain amount of peace that you can get like sure like of course I want my dad to be alive but at the same time you know like he lived a life and like he was an awesome dad and I, I'm grateful for the person that he was and it was his time to go and I can be okay with that. Right? Like if you think about a relationship where you're long distance with someone and you guys try things for 18 months and then the relationship, you guys just sort of mutually decide that it's like, it's too hard. We're just like, it's too much work and this relationship is not going in the right direction and we should break up. And both of you guys can be sad, but you don't have to suffer because of it. Right? You can both understand, you can have some degree of peace or contentment and understand that this is the right thing even though it hurts. Like a flu vaccine. So someone is asking, can pain is physical, suffering is mental? No. Right? So you can have mental pain too. So the, the source of suffering is attachment. It's not just an emotion, it's attachment. Right? So if we think about what what about my dad's situation would have left left me with more suffering is if I had like still wanted him to be alive. If I had felt like he hadn't lived a complete life. If I hadn't gotten from him everything that I really needed to. If I was still attached to him being alive, like the way that I am with, you know, my family and my kids. Like I'm attached to them. I don't want them to go anywhere. Like I'm not at peace with that. So attachment is the root of suffering. Like, for example, I'll give you guys just another example about dating and friendship, right? So if I want to, like, date someone, I can be attracted to them, and I can ask them out, and I can say, hey, do you want to go out on, on a date? Can I buy you dinner sometime? And they can say, no, I'm seeing someone, but thank you very much, I'm flattered. And then I can be disappointed, but I don't have to be bent out of shape, right? Like, I don't have to go home and, like, cry into my pillow. Like, I don't have to do that. Now, if I was attached to her, I would. If I had, like, built up this, like, this castle in, in my mind of, like, what our relationship was going to be like, this fantasy, and that we were going to go out, and then she was going to be my waifu, and then we would get married, and then, you know, she would, like, like, we would spend Christmas like this, and she would make me, like, breakfast every morning, and then I would make her dinner every night, and if I had, like, built up all these attachments around the relationship, then I'm going to suffer. But if I don't have attachments, if I understand that, did I want to go out with her? Absolutely. Did I, did I, am I disappointed? Sure. But I don't have to suffer, or at least not intensely. So suffering is related to attachment and pain and emotions are in the mind. And attachment actually is rooted in the mind, but like the suffering happens kind of outside of the mind. Um, so, huh, yeah, so a couple of, a uh, couple of points, okay? So 
depression and unhappiness can be related. But I think the main question here, how do you know if, if you're... Oh, so many good questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to stick with lupus's questions, okay? How do you end suffering or change it to pain if it makes sense? It does make sense. So the first thing to understand is that, like, you can't avoid pain in life, right? There's going to be disappointment. There's going to be sadness. There's going to be grief. You can, however, do something about suffering. So suffering is, is about attachment. And so the way to end your suffering is to cultivate something called vairagya, which means detachment. So to be detached from the outcomes of your actions. And the most important thing, the most important source of attachment for most people that I work with is specifically with the outcomes of their actions. So there's a big difference between wanting to ask a girl out and wanting her to say yes and being having an expectation or hope or fantasy that's based on that. Like, and if you guys, I, I use this because, I mean, I use the the relationship example because I just, I think it's like a raw example that a lot of people can relate to because it really captures this idea. There are other examples. Like, let's talk about a promotion, right? I can want a promotion, but I can also get like really caught up in it. I can get really invested in the promotion. The pr promotion means the world to me. And if I don't get it, my life is shattered. So I'm attaching myself to the outcome. It's like, I want to go to Harvard or Stanford or Yale. And so I like, like, it's, everyone can want to go there. Anyone can want to go there. But it's the people who get attached to that idea who are devastated when they don't get it. And then if you're not attached to it, like, you could still want something. Like, I didn't want my dad to die, but I understood it was his time. Right? Is there are some things that I've wanted in life that I didn't get, which I'm bummed out about, but I don't like suffer. So I think what lupus needs to do is to understand, first of all, that you're, you're, you're probably lacking. So your question, a couple of questions. One is how do you, how do you move from suffering to pain? And the answer is to cultivate detachment. How do you cultivate detachment? It's to focus on your actions instead of the outcomes of your actions. It's the difference between I really want an A on this test and I'm going to study four hours a day for the next week until I take the test. Those are two very, very different things. They may both look the same, but what you tell yourself in your mind, both of them may result in you studying four hours a day. But it's what happens in here. Are you focusing on what you do or are you focusing on what happens? Are you saying, I'm going to ask that girl out or I really, really want her to say yes? There's a difference between I like that girl, I'd love to go on a date with her, and I really, really, really want her to be my girlfriend. She's the one. She's the one. Right? That's attachment. You guys see the difference between that? Like, I really like her. She's cool. I'd love to go out, out with her. And she's the one. She's the one. I know she's the one. Like, she's the one. That's attachment. So if you're suffering in life, chances are the source of your suffering is something related to attachment. Another good question. Wouldn't being detached make someone feel numb all the time? No. In fact, the exact opposite. If you live a detached life, you feel more fulfilled. Right? Because think about this for a second. If, you're, if I really want to go out with her, and let's just play this, this um, tape through to the end. Yeah, I know, Lupus. So I'm tempted to say, if you, like, we got, we're going to switch to meditation, but you should come on stream. Or if you want to hop on Discord, we can talk now. But, um, so, yeah, so we're going to do, we're going to, okay, so let's just take a step back. Okay, so first thing is, suffering comes from attachment. Peace, com peace or contentment comes from detachment. Now, most people think that apathy and detachment are the same thing. They think that detachment means not caring. No. Just listen to what I'm saying, okay? I like a girl. I think she's attractive. I want to go on a date with her. Does that mean that I don't care? No. It doesn't mean that I don't care. I have wants. I have desires. But it just means that I'm not, like, bent out of shape about her, right? And so then what happens is if I ask her out and she says yes, then the question becomes, like, what is, what is that? What, how do you think that that person feels? Hmm? 
How does that person feel? Good, right? It, I'll tell you what it feels like. It feels like Christmas came early this year. That's that's what it feels like to them, right? It's like, yeah, she said yes, right? And that's different from if the attached person, if if she says yes and the person is obsessed with her, he actually doesn't even feel great. He feels like, like I mean, he's going to get so obsessed, right? He's like, oh my God, like this is going to be like, this is the first step to everything else. Like, this is going to be amazing. Like, oh my God, this is going to be so awesome. She's going to be, she's perfect. I knew she was perfect. I knew it. They get obsessed. Whereas the person who she says yes, it's like, yeah, man, like we're, let's do this. Like, let's have fun. No, it, our love is completely different. Okay? So the interesting thing is that attachment and expectation are related. Okay, when you have attachments, you have expectations. I'm asking her out and I expect her to say yes. I'm putting my eggs in the yes basket. And so then the question becomes, so if attachment has to do with expectation and detachment has to do with a lack of expectation, so detachment, lack of expectation, how do you feel when you don't expect something and you get it? Absolutely, right? So like buying the buying the uh, lottery ticket and winning the lottery, you would feel amazing. No question. Not buying a lottery ticket and finding a winning lottery ticket in your pocket? would feel even better. Right? Like, it's crazy. So, th this is where I, I've... Okay, so we're going to talk about meditation. And so, like, I, I want you guys to do something for me. So what I want you to do, and we'll get to lupus in a second, okay? Um, so what I want you guys to do is pay attention to which moments of the week between now and next week... So let's let's do another Discord set of, like, write a paragraph to a page about which moments were you the most happy. Like, try to find a moment of pure happiness. Like, it doesn't have to be a big happiness, but just, like, the purest, like, the most untainted moment of happiness. So when I say most happy, it implies, like, you know, something big has to happen. I'm not talking about the size of the happiness. I'm talking about the purity of the happiness. So when is, like, a moment that you just like, when is like, when are the purest moments of happiness in your week? And where are the purest moments of suffering in your week? And really describe them, describe the scenario. And then see if there's any relationship between an ex the existence of an expectation and that happiness or disappointment. You have to catch yourself, right? You have to pay attention because it's going to be tiny, tiny things. Tiny, tiny, tiny things. So I'll tell you guys what it is for me. Which is like, I solicit hugs and kisses from my two daughters all the time. I solicit them. I ask for them. And then if I don't get them, I'm bummed out. If I do get them, I'm happy. But there are some times, some times where I'm just sitting there, I'm not doing anything. I'm like cooking or something like that. And one of my kids walks around and is like, Daddy, I want to give you a hug. And then they give me like this really, really great hug. And on, in that moment, I feel in pure bliss. Right? That's pure bliss. That's pure happiness. And I mean, don't get me wrong. It feels great when, when like I need a hug and they give me a hug. Right? Yeah, oxytocin. Right? And so, like, you guys are talking about Game of Thrones, so, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just drive this home, okay? So, Game of Thrones, if you guys want to re-watch season eight, do you think if you watch it the second time around, you're gonna enjoy it less or more? Ah, why? Yeah, right? Because you had this expectation for it to be like a satisfying conclusion. And it wasn't. It was disappointing. And so if you go and you rewatch it, you know it's going to be a shit show. You have no expectations. You know it's going to suck. 
and then you can enjoy it. You can just, like, look for all the glaring potholes, and you can laugh at each one. And so just think about this. If you can make season eight of Game of Thrones an enjoyable experience, like, that's what Buddha figured out. That's what enlightenment is. Is living your life and being able to enjoy season eight of Game of Thrones. That's enlightenment. Modern day definition of enlightenment.